So I just had finished talking about NSAIDs as a group, but I want to spend a fair amount of time going over some of these individually. Although they all do the same three things typically, anti-inflammatory, pain control, fever control, you're going to find some have better abilities at that than others do in specific situations. Why, we really don't know. Why is flunixin such a great analgesic compared to aspirin if they both inhibit cyclooxygenase? We just don't know, okay? But these things exist and you need to be aware of them. So um, the non-selectives I'm gonna cover first, okay? These tend to be our older NSAIDs, but still used quite a bit. Okay, um, particularly aspirin, butin, flunixin, and we have niche uses for the others. Okay, and then in small animals, the COX 2s have largely taken over. We don't use very many of the older non selectives in small animals except for niche uses of aspirin and paroxicam. Okay. Uh, by the way, on that prior slide, you might have noticed under non, um, the non-selective, I had crossed out a drug called dipyrone or Novin. I left it on there. It's no longer marketed. I left it on there to make a point because I occasionally see posts where practitioners are getting um, dipyrone compounded. Dipyrone is a non-selective uh, NSAID that was really good at controlling fevers, okay? Uh, but it was removed from the market really at the insistence of the FDA because it causes aplastic anemia in humans and it was being used extra labelly in dairies, particularly uh, more rather than dairies in veal calf operations. So they said, hey, this is a public threat unless you can show that it's safe and effective in veal calves, uh, you need to take it off, so they did. And practitioners will compound because they want that extra good antipyretic effect. But the bottom line is all our NSAIDs have an antipyretic effect, so there's really no need to compound dipyrone. Uh, it's, a, it's an ancient drug that uh, I just mentioned for historical. And I've already mentioned to you Zubrin. It was really a neat little drug. It was a dual COX-LOX inhibitor. I mentioned it relative to the lipoxygenase. Uh, nothing wrong with it. It just couldn't get, make enough money for the company. So that was removed. All right. But let's start with the oldest NSAID, aspirin. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. Okay, it's metabolized very rapidly to salicylic acid or salicylate. Been around a long time. I'm sure most of you have heard uh, that willow bark has salicylate in it. And so uh, supposedly um, Native Americans and possibly other cultures would chew willow bark as a uh, fever control or pain control. So it's been around a while. But Bayer was the first company that came in and actually made acetyl salicylic acid in the early 20th century and really was somewhat of a miracle drug at the time. Now, uh, it will control fever and mild to moderate somatic pain. Now, you'll read about it as an anti-inflammatory and it has been used in human medicine for that. Uh, for things like rheumatoid arthritis, but at really high doses. That's one of the things you're going to see is that anti-inflammatory doses typically are high doses of the NSAID compared to the doses we use for fever and pain control, okay? And uh, we talk about analgesics as being effective either on visceral pain or somatic pain. Visceral pain is the viscera. It's, uh, think of the GI tract, the colic, uh, the horse, this sort of thing. That's visceral pain uh, from the abdominal or thoracic cavities. Uh, somatic pain is musculoskeletal, skin, this sort of thing. Aspirin does a fair job on somatic pain, but not really much effect at all on visceral pain. So you'll never see it used in a colic horse or anything like that. 
probably the biggest use for aspirin these days, though, is as an anticoagulant. It inhibits thromboxane of the platelet uh, and permanently inactivates it. I mentioned yesterday all the NSAIDs have some effect, but aspirin is unique in that it permanently inactivates it. And it's not the salicylate, it's the acetyl salicylate that permanently inactivates it. So it's before it's metabolized that that permanent inactivation of the platelet occurs. Now, interestingly, you know, there are always species differences, and it turns out that cattle uh, are, uh, platelets are not affected by aspirin. We don't know why, but it is not an anticoagulant in cattle. And if you're into trivia, it also doesn't work in rats and Asian elephants. <laughs> All right. I don't know who picks the species to study, but uh, uh, <clears throat> so there's something else driving platelet coagulation in those species besides thromboxane. Okay. There are some uh, little used injectable aspirin products. More commonly, it's sodium salicylate. Largely, aspirin is an oral product. All right, lower doses for fever, as I said, really high doses for anti-inflammatory. And you don't have to know these doses, but I want you to uh, kind of have a feel for how they relate to one another, all right? Uh, aspirin is, is really good in the dog. We use it at 10 to 20 mg per kilogram every 12 hours orally. Now, uh, <coughs> antiplatelet dose this says one, probably I would use two. Uh, Mackin's group did a study and they, I think they found uh, like 70, 80 percent of the dogs were inhibited at one mg per kg per day. Uh, they didn't study two mg per kg, the current recommendation, but they presume it must be better. So that's kind of a jump they made uh, on, on that. But if you use it, there are several types of aspirin tablets out there. You have regular aspirin, you have buffered aspirin, you have aspirin plus uh, an acid uh, called a, um, the ascriptin, and you have enteric coated aspirin like Ecotrin. All right. And uh, everything but the plain, the buffered, the antacid, and the enteric, is trying to get away from a local chemical irritation of the stomach. Now, all NSAIDs, by inhibiting prostaglandins, can cause stomach ulcers. That's a systemic effect. But aspirin particularly is uh, actually chemically caustic when it sits on the stomach lining, all right? So they're trying to get away from that actual burn by the tablet, okay? And I, I have no particular preference of whether I use plain aspirin, buffered aspirin, or the ascriptin and acid combination, more commonly buffered aspirin. But you don't want to use the enteric coated product. That's because it tends to hang up in the gastric mucosa and not dissolve. Okay, the Ecotrin was made for humans, not dogs or cats. So they were doing a study trying to determine how uh, best to use the enteric coated products and the plasma concentrations were all over the place. Some it was, it was fine, and others there was none almost. All right, and they say, what in the heck is going on? So they ran an endoscope down these dogs, and the ones with no concentrations, the, the aspirin tablets were actually stuck to the stomach lining. All right, they wouldn't uh, dissolve and pass through. These enteric coatings typically uh, are acid resistant, but in neutral to alkaline pHs in the small intestine, that's where they dissolve and release their product. Well, these were never leaving the stomach. Not this specific product, but I'll also mention it. it's kind of risky using any enteric human product, enteric coated human product in small animals because small animals have a much shorter GI tract than man does. And there have been issues with some of these other enteric coatings passing intact. They never dissolve uh, um, <coughs> in the small animal. But anyway, use any of the other products, but don't use the enteric coated. Now, I do recommend that you give the aspirin with a little bit of food. Again, have something on the stomachs to minimize that uh, potential for caustic burn. Yes, question. So, uh, aren't a 
the market, I guess, like at the grocery store, if I were to get aspirin, how much of it is going to be like the enteric coated versus just like the regular? Your regular aspirin is typically buffered aspirin, and that's typically what I would use. Uh, it'll specifically say uh, enteric coated, and Ecotrin is the, the most common trade name. That's the one you avoid. Okay. Um, now, people will say you can't use aspirin in the cat because we've had a lot of aspirin toxicities in kitty cats historically. And it's not that you can't use it in the cat, it's that you have to dose it correctly. The cat has a much longer half-life than the dog does, longer than any other species. So we give the same dose, okay, but the next dose doesn't occur until two to three days later because it's got such a long half-life. If you try to dose it like a dog, yes, you will poison the cat. All right, but if you use it appropriately, it, it is effective. And what I would usually do is I would give uh, an aspirin, when I used it chronically in the cat, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and skip the weekend. That was a way of keeping an owner on a, on a weekly schedule. Uh, for aspirin. And it turns out most um, cats weigh 8 to, to 12 pounds or so, and a baby aspirin is uh, about the right size for them. Regular aspirin uh, that you use is 325 milligrams per tablet. Baby aspirin is 80 milligrams per tablet. Again, you don't have to know that, but it's used a lot. All right. Now, the cow is really interesting. I've already mentioned it's not an anticoagulant in the cow. All right, but whereas the cat has a really long half-life and hangs around forever, the cow and the horse have a really short half-life, really, really short. But you've got an advantage in the cow. You've got a rumen, all right, and that is a huge container. You know, a rumen in an adult cow will be 30 to 50 gallons, okay. And, of course, for rumen physiology, it's mixing things around and it meters out the material, the fluid, uh, through the esophageal groove into the uh, abomasum by way of the omasum. So it's, you've got a built-in sustained release device in the cow, okay? So what you, we can do is we give huge doses of aspirin <coughs> and that rumen meters it out over time. So we give the dose of aspirin in a cow is 100 to 200 milligrams per kilogram, 10 times what we would use in the dog every 12 hours. But we're able to use it because of that um, rumen. Now, uh, <coughs> you know, it, it, it'd be tempted if the farmer called up, we'll give him one or two bottles of aspirin and call me in the morning, that sort of thing. Uh, but they actually make aspirin boluses for large animals. They're, they're huge, like they're half the size of your hand. Uh, <clears throat> they're not an approved product. It's one of those products that the FDA allows to be legally marketed because it's not causing any problems. So you can get aspirin bo uh, boluses and they're used. Now having said that, uh, its main use has been for fevers, that sort of thing, because it's not a great analgesic, so you're not going to see a lot of aspirin use in cattle. Yes? So, I don't know much about working medicine, but is it, since it's not um, approved, can you just get it at the co-op? Like, other things, or is it that? Yes, sometimes you'll find it at the co-op, other times you'll, you'll find it at a, um, a drug distributor that you do business with, this sort of thing. But it's pretty readily available if you look for it. Now, the horse um, has the same short half-life, just a, an hour or two, but it doesn't have a rumen. Um, so we, we kind of don't have that advantage that we have in the cow. So it's really, really hard to dose a horse into the therapeutic range to control fever or pain without overdosing them. You'd have to give little doses every few hours. I figured it out one time to, to stay above the therapeutic concentration but below the toxic concentration, we would have to dose horses at 35 mg per kg every two hours. 
well, that's not going to happen. All right. So uh, the bottom line for me is in the horse, it is only an anticoagulant. It, you really can't dose it uh, in order to control fever or pain. All right. Now the pig is really interesting. Uh, you'd be surprised how much aspirin is used in pigs. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that one of the few things that really helps swine influenza um, pig patients, not human patients, pig patients swine influenza is aspirin. They feel better, uh, they go back on feed better, it's just like you have the flu and you take aspirin and you feel better. Well, it works for pigs too. So uh, what they'll do there, either they'll find the water-soluble aspirin or more commonly they'll buy what's called sodium salicylate. It's not aspirin, it's not acetyl salicylic acid, it's just to salicylate the metabolite. But that one's readily water-soluble and it will dissolve and go into the water supply. So that's a way of getting it into the pigs for swine um, uh, influenza. All right, any questions about aspirin? You'll still use it, but primarily in small animals and horses as an anticoagulant. But it's good when the owner calls you up and you need something at night. Uh, and you don't want to bring them in, you can give them some aspirin. All right, um, other really big one that you'll still use, especially in horses, is phenylbutazone. It has excellent musculoskeletal uh, pain control. That's why you, you'll still use it. It's really good for joint uh, and bone uh, and soft tissue pain. So the lame horse, you'll use a lot of bute still. All right, it works really well, and it will control moderate visceral pain. So your mild, moderate colic, uh, you can use uh, bute on. It can go orally or IV. Um, <clears throat> it was actually shown cattle, it can go sub-Q, but we have an issue with withdrawals and residue violation, so that's no longer recommended. So IV or oral in uh, primarily horses. And you can get butte paste that's pre-made. Some uh, uh, people will take the one gram butte tablets and grind it up in caro syrup and give it that way, but that, that's oral. Now, in the concentrated form in the horse, if you get it outside the vein, you will get perivascular inflammation. So it might slough, it might not, but you want to get it in the vein. A, a horse is not a cow. Uh, <clears throat> so they, they react more to extravasation. Now, uh, Butte is kind of interesting. It, it was first used in humans, uh, for, and it's still used occasionally. It's really good for gout in humans, for the pain of gout. Um, I had a... Uh, um, acquaintance that worked for us, he had bad gout, and that's what his physician was giving him, was butte. Um, <clears throat> so they said, well, this is a great, great drug. This is back in, I guess, the 50s or 60s when it came out. And they said, let's put it in a horse. And, then, and they said, first thing they said was, this doesn't work. This is worthless in the horse. And then they took a look at the, the half-life difference and you have to give substantially larger doses more frequently in the horse for it to be effective. Again, it's an idea of, of kinetics has a place of how we use a drug. Once they discovered the half-life and how to dose it, they discovered, hey, this is a great drug in the horse, all right? Now, we used to use it in the dog, but we have better, better drugs now. No one uses butte. And it's not used in cats at all, or never was. Um, there were some concerns whether or not it was toxic in cats that really was unexplored. So not a small animal drug, but you'll still use a lot of it in horses, okay? What about cattle? 36-hour uh, half-life, uh, that's pretty long. Not as good as the human, but it's still pretty long. Uh, and that made it really cheap and really convenient. And I have to admit, I liked it in cattle. I have, I'd get a lame bull in, and rather than running around injecting him with banamine, or, which is flu nixon, uh, I could put um, 
some butte in his sweet feed and he'd eat it readily and dose him every two days. Okay, and that's really convenient and it was really cheap. 10 mix per kig, priming dose, loading dose, and then five mix per kig every other day. All right, <coughs> uh, really severe pain, I'd go like three mix per kig daily. The problem, of course, again, is that it has been linked to aplastic anemia in humans. All right, again, that type B adverse reaction. It kind of amuses me the way our profession uh, view certain things. Everyone is really key, keyed in on chloramphenicol causing aplastic anemia in humans. So they're real meticulous about whenever they draw up chloramphenicol for the horse or they make the tablets. They're wearing masks and everything. And Butte does the same thing and they just pop it in, in a food mixer and grind it up and dust goes everywhere and they go, oh, oh, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I'd be a little more cautious. Um, it's not a big risk, but it's still a risk. All right. So now um, we used it for a long time in cattle because it was, and I really loved it in beef cattle, especially I saw a lot of lame bulls. But you know how people are, they'll abuse things and then the rest of us that are using it right wind up paying a price for their abuse. And what was happening, it was such a good drug that it was being used in cold dairy cows. All right, cold dairy cows, lameness is a major reason that they're cold. Uh, so they found out if they put them on phenylbutazone, they felt better and they looked good when they went to slaughter. Uh, <coughs> um, so uh, again, the FDA had to step in and say, hey guys, you can't do this. All right, we're finding too many cold dairy cows with phenylbutazone residues. So that's now why it's banned from extra label use according to Amduca. You cannot use butte in a dairy cow. And remember, a dairy cow is any dairy breed over 20 months of age, whether it's lactating or not, okay? Now, uh, it's not banned in beef cattle, but people are so shy from the dairy aspect that it's not used very much. It could be used. I wouldn't hesitate to use it in a beef cow if I could trust the owner to follow the withdrawal times. It's got, depending on who you read, 45 to 60 day withdrawal. All right. Now the problem comes in is if that is truly a salvage case, if he's, if, if he's so bad you're not going to cure him, you're just trying to palliate him, what do you do? And, and the best I could, can come up with is to do something along the lines of keep him on butte until I make that decision and then a few days uh, and then switch him over to flu Nixon, which we have an established withdrawal for, uh, for pain control there but you'll use a lot of butte in horses still. And the dose, there's a range of doses, and what you'll find is that range has a, has a reason it's there. Uh, some acute early pain, you need the high doses. Some of these chronic pain horses, um, chronic laminitis, chronic navicular disease, you can get down to pretty low doses of butte and still control them. 